So coming to the orbit, so these are two bony sockets which are located in the face which lodges eyeballs, muscles, vessels and the nerves. So before going to see the contents, we must know about the boundaries of orbit. So here in this picture, we can identify the skull and I have separated one particular orbit, right side orbit, to show you the boundaries. So the shape of this orbit is four-sided pyramid, apex is projecting posterior medially and it is having four sides means roof, floor, medial wall and the lateral wall. So first let me show you the apex. So apex is projecting posterior medially and here we can identify a foramen called as optic canal. So this optic canal is contributed by the sphenoid whereas the base which is formed by the margins of orbit so at the anterior part of the orbit we can identify four margins superior inferior medial and the lateral so these four margins forming the base of orbit then coming to the boundaries the roof floor lateral wall and the medial wall so coming to the roof so this roof is contributed by anterior part is formed by orbital plate of frontal bone whereas posterior part is contributed by lesser wing of sphenoid bone. And coming to the roof, we can identify a fossa for lacrimal gland which is present in the lateral part of the roof. So the, this, this depression which lodges the lacrimal gland and medially we can identify a notch called as trochlear notch. And this trochlear notch, we can identify a tendon which is holding the superior oblique muscle. Yeah, here you can see the fossa for lacrimal gland and medially you can identify the trochlear notch. Then coming to the floor of orbit. Floor is contributed by orbital surface of maxilla medially and laterally it is contributed by zygomatic bone. Means one fourth part of the floor is contributed by zygomatic bone whereas the three fourths is contributed by maxilla. And most, I mean posteriorly, strictly speaking, posterior medially, a small bony part of the palatine bone called as orbital process of the palatine bone, which is also contributing to form the floor of uh, floor of the orbit. Here on the orbital surface of maxilla, we can identify a groove called as infraorbital groove, which passing the infraorbital vessels and nerves. So the infraorbital vessels, which are the branches of the maxillary artery in its branches. Then coming to the lateral wall, lateral wall is formed by zygomatic bone and posterior part of the lateral wall is contributed by greater wing of sphenoid bone. And coming to the lateral wall, so outside part of the lateral wall means on the zygomatic bone we can identify a tubercle called as Wittner's tubercle. This tubercle which is giving attachment to lateral palpebral ligament. And we can identify a foramen outside called as zygomatico temporal foramina which passing the zygomatico temporal nerve. So here I am showing you the lateral palpebral ligament which is uh, fusing with the lateral vitals tubercle. And this part which is giving attachment to the palpebral part of orbicularis oculi muscle. Then coming to the superior orbital fissure. So at the lateral wall posterior part we can identify a fissure called as superior orbital fissure. This fissure is contributed by the sphenoid bone and this fissure is passing the four muscles and as well as some nerves and the vessels. So, on the greater wing of sphenoid bone, you can identify a tubercle. So, this tubercle, which is giving attachment to a common tendinous ring of zin, and common tendinous ring of zin, which is giving origin to the four recti muscles superior recti, inferior recti, lateral rectus, and the medial recti. So, here I'm showing you the tendinous ring and the four muscles which are arising from the common tendinous ring of zin. So this common tendinous ring of zin which is attaching to the tubercle of the greater wing of sphenoid bone 
Let me show you the structures passing through the superior orbital fissure. So this common tendinous ring of Zinn is separating the superior orbital fissure into three compartments, lateral, intermediate and medial. So the lateral compartment passing three nerves, one is lacrimal, frontal and trochlear. Along with the vein, vein is also passing through that called as superior ophthalmic vein. And then coming to the intermediate compartment of superior orbital fissure, it is passing three nerves called as nesociliary and two divisions of oculomotor and the abducens. And the medial compartment, medial compartment which is passing the inferior ophthalmic vein. Sometimes inferior ophthalmic vein, it may pass through the inferior orbital fissure. That fissure we will discuss in the next class. Yeah, here I am showing you the inferior orbital fissure. Sometimes the inferior ophthalmic vein, it may pass through this fissure. Then coming to the medial wall. Medial wall is contributed by anterior to posterior. First one is the lacrimal fossa. Means, so this lacrimal fossa is contributed by the lacrimal bones. And most anterior, we can identify the frontal process of the maxilla. Then the lacrimal bone. Then posterior to the lacrimal bone, you can identify the ethmoid bone. So, anterior to posterior, the medial wall is contributed by frontal cross of maxilla, lacrimal bone and the ethmoid bone. And then coming to the inside part. So, so far I have discussed about the four sides of pyramid, means the four sides of the orbit. So, roof, floor, medial wall and the lateral wall. Now, we entered into the orbit and what are the structures we can identify inside the orbit. So, soon after, remo uh, soon after the removal of the a roof of the orbit means the orbital plate of frontal bone we can identify a fascia called as orbital fascia or periorbital so this fascia which is covering entire the recti muscles entire the recti muscles it is also called as periosteum of the orbit periosteum of the orbit then what are the structures contents we can identify inside that so we can identify eyeball then muscles of the eyeball then fascia bulbi nerves the nerves are optic, oculomotor, trochlear, abducens, ophthalmic, ciliary ganglion. The vessels are ophthalmic artery, ophthalmic vein. Then we can identify lacrimal gland. And all the structures are covered by a pad of fat called as orbital pad of fat. So uh, for eyeball, we have a separate class. So we are going to discuss about the extrinsic muscles of the orbit. Then coming to this extrinsic or extraocular muscles, there are seven voluntary muscles are there. In that seven voluntary muscles, four recti muscles. They are superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, and lateral rectus. These four rectus muscles they are responsible for the movement of the eyeball along with the two oblique muscles, superior oblique and the inferior oblique. So superior, inferior, medial, and lateral rectus, and then superior and the inferior oblique. These six muscles are responsible for the movement of the eyeball whereas another muscle which is present along with this recti and the oblique muscles called as the levator palpebrae superioris which is responsible for the movement of the upper eyelid so let me show you other two uh, three involuntary muscles or smooth muscles also present called as superior tarsal or muller's muscle inferior tarsal or and orbitalis muscle superior tarsal, inferior tarsal and orbitalis muscle. These are the smooth muscles which are present along with that extrinsic or extraocular muscles. So coming to the recti muscles, the four recti muscles, all the recti muscles arise from the corresponding margins of the common tendinous ring of Zinn. So where we have seen this common tendinous ring of Zinn which is separating the superior orbital fissure into three compartments that common tendinous ring of zin which is giving origin to this four recti muscles and the lateral rectus arises by the two heads it is having two heads so the first head coming from the common tendinous ring of zin then other head which is coming from the sphenoid bone all the recti muscles are inserted into the sclera little posterior to the limbus means corneoscleral junction in front of the equator of the eyeball. 
So in this image, I'm showing you the insertion of all four rectal muscles behind the corneoscleral junction. Coming to the oblique muscles, superior oblique. So superior oblique, which is arising from the body of sphenoid bone and the superior medial to the optic canal. Yes, here you can see the superior oblique muscle. Then the course and insertion, it runs forwards if in the upper part of the orbit. It is exactly present above the medial rectus. So near the orbital margin, the muscle ends in a tendon passing through a tendinous pulley. Yes, here you can see that how it is running just above the medial rectus and it is holded by the tendinous pulley. Then it is running posteriorly and reaches to the equator of the eyeball. Then tendon then runs backwards and laterally to be inserted into the upper lateral quadrant of eyeball behind the equator. So in this image you can see clearly the insertion of the superior oblique muscle. Then comes inferior oblique muscle. So the inferior oblique origin is anterior and the medial part of the floor of the orbit that is orbital surface of the maxilla. Then the muscle fibers how they arise. So in this I am showing you the floor of the orbit that is orbital surface of the maxilla where it is giving origin to the inferior oblique muscle. And then the course and insertion is if muscle winds round the eyeball to reach the lateral part of the sclera behind the equator of eyeball. Yes, here you can see that. So it is encircling entire the inferior part of the eyeball. Then the nerve supply is on the extraocular or extrinsic muscles of the orbit which moves the eyeball are supplied by oculomotor nerve except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. So the lateral rectus is supplied by sixth cranial nerve that is the obducent. Superior oblique is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve fourth cranial nerve that is trochlear nerve. Now coming to the axis of the muscles. So if you see the axis of the muscles, so the orbits are projecting anterolaterally. So when you are looking forwards, the two eyes will be looking forwards. So it is forming an axis between the anatomical position and the projection of the orbits. So that axis is called as visual axis or optical axis. So in the normal position, whereas if you keep the eyeballs in the exactly the orbits, the eyes will be looking anterolaterally. That axis is called as orbital axis. So the between the orbital axis and the visual axis, we can identify some angle. So this angle is called as visual axis. So this angle is about 23 degrees, 23 degrees. Then coming to the horizontal axis, so when the two eyes looking forwards, so the midpoint, the equator of right and left, right and left eye, it is forming the horizontal axis. So the medial rectus and the lateral rectus, super rectus and the inferior rectus, these four muscles are very, very important and necessary to move the eyeball. So in the abducted eye, in the abducted eye, the superior recti and the inferior recti coincides with the optical axis. Yes, here you can see this superior oblique. Then coming to the adducted eye. In the adducted eye, optical axis coincides with the axis of oblique muscles. So the coming to the axis of the movement, elevation and depression around the transverse axis passing through the equator. So here you can identify in this image, I am showing you the elevation. Two eyeballs are moving upwards, while as elevation and the depression, the two eyeballs moving downwards, looking down. Then adduction and abduction. So these two moments around the vertical axis passing through the equator in these two moments. So coming other moments, coming to the other moments, so rotation. The torsion is also called as around the anterior posterior axis extending from anterior pole to the posterior pole of the eyeball. When 12 o'clock position of the cornea rotates medial, it is called as intorsion. When it rotates lateral, it is called as extorsion.
let me show you how the in torsion and extorsion moments happens. So in the 12 o'clock position means if you move the eyeballs upwards and then if you rotate it medially that is called as in torsion, if you rotate it laterally that is called as extorsion. Yes, here in this image you can see the in torsion and here is extorsion. Now which muscles are responsible for these moments? Eye movements produced by the muscles. No movement is done by a single muscle. While some muscles act as a prime movers, others act as synergies. Now let me show you the adduction. Adduction movement is carried out by the medial rectus assisted by superior oblique, sorry, superior and the inferior rectus muscles. Whereas coming to the abduction, lateral rectus assisted by superior oblique and the inferior oblique. Here you can see how these two, I mean, abduction and adduction happens. So, abduction and adduction, we cannot do the same movement with two eyeballs. So, if one eye is abducted, another eye will be adduct. So, try to observe this right eye, it is abducted, then you can see the adduction. Then coming to the elevation, elevation is carried out by the superior rectus and the inferior oblique in the primary position. Then superior rectus only in the abducted eye, it, it acts, whereas the inferior eye, oblique, it acts in adducted eye. Then coming to the depression, depression movement is carried out by the inferior rectus, it is pulling the eyeball down along with the superior oblique muscle. In the abducted eye, inferior rectus only acts. In the adducted eye, so the superior oblique muscle acts. Then coming to the intorsion and extorsion. Intorsion movement means in the 12 o'clock position, rotating medially, that is called as intorsion. It is carried out by the superior rectus and the superior oblique. The extorsion is carried out by the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique muscle. So in this image you can identify how the intorsion movement is happening and how the extorsion is happening. Coming to the associated movements of the eyeball, one is conjugate movements, when both the eyes move in the same direction with the visible axis being parallel, that is called as conjugate movements. There are two movements are there, one is superduction and subduction. So these are the two conjugate movements. Disconjugate movements when the axis of both eyes converge or the diverge, such movements are known as conjugate movements. So that is about the four rectile muscles, the two oblique muscles, and how they are responsible for all the movements. Now coming to the seventh muscle that is levator palpebrae superioris muscle. The origin of this muscle is it is arising from the undersurface of lesser wing of sphenoid bone at the apex of the orbit just above the common tendinous ring of zin by a narrow tendon and the insertion it is it is going to divide into three lamellae upper intermediate and the lower lamellae so the middle part we can identify this a broad part and the insertion it is going to divide into three lamellae so the upper lamellae consisting of skeletal muscle it penetrates the orbital septum passing through the fibers of orbicularis oculi to be inserted onto the skin of the upper eyelid Whereas the intermediate lamella consisting of smooth muscles, the superior tarsal muscle, it is inserted onto the upper border of superior tarsal plate. Yes, here you can see the upper and the intermediate lamella. Then coming to the lower lamella, a lower lamella consisting of connective tissue is inserted onto the superior fornix of conjunctiva. That is about the levator palpebrae superioris. The fascia bulbi is also called as tenon's capsule. It is a loose membranous sheet that envelops the eyeball and extends from optic nerve to the sclerocorneal junction. Then it is separated by the, uh, from the sclera by episcleral space. Then the tenon's capsule forms a socket for the eyeball to facilitate free ocular movements. Yeah, here you can see the other ligament is suspensory ligament of Lockwood or check ligaments of the eye. One is medial check ligament which is attaching to the medial part of the roof of the orbit. Lateral check ligament which is attaching to the lateral part of the roof of the orbit anterior to the lacrimal fossa. This lateral check ligament is fusing. 
Then coming to the clinical aspect of it, if suspensory ligament of eye remains intact, when the floor of the orbit is fractured or the maxilla is removed surgically, the eyeball does not sag because of these check ligaments and the suspensory ligament of eye. Coming to the nerves and the blood vessels of the orbit. First, let me show you the nerves of the orbit. So the first one is somatic and autonomic motor and somatic sensory nerves are found in the orbit. So the one is oculomotor, trochlear and abducens nerves supply the extraocular muscles. The sensory nerves within the orbit are the optic, ophthalmic and the maxillary division of trigeminal nerves. Then coming to the parasympathetic fibers from the oculomotor nerves supply the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscle that is ciliaris via ciliary ganglia. There is a facial nerve, so the lacrimal gland and the choroid via pterygoparotene ganglia. And sympathetic fibers are supplied by the direct and sympathetic fibers are supplied into the uh, pupillae, which is causing dilator pupillae. And infraorbital and the zygomatic nerves, that is infraorbital is a branch of the maxillary division of trigeminal nerve. And coming to the optic nerve, this nerve is this nerve of sight is 4 cm strong and it is made up of 1 million myelinated nerve fibers. The optic nerve emerges from the eyeball, 3 or 4 mm nasal to the posterior pole of the eyeball and it is running back posteriorly and passes medially passing through the optic canal which is contributed by the lesser wing of sphenoid bone to enter the cranial cavity, strictly speaking middle cranial fossa where it joins with the optic chiasma then the entire nerve is enclosed in a three meningeal sheet derived from the meninges of the brain. The subarachnoid space around the brain therefore extends around the nerve up to the eyeball. The relations are the central artery and the vein of the ner- vein of the retina pierce the optic nerve inferomedially about 1.25 cm behind the eyeball. Here you can see this the central artery and the vein of the retina piercing the optic nerve. Then the optic nerve is crossed superiorly from before backwards by superior ophthalmic vein, then ophthalmic artery and the nasociliar nerve. So these structures, superior ophthalmic vein, then superior ophthalmic artery and the nasociliar nerve, these structures are crossing the optic nerve, whereas the other structures means the central artery and the vein of the retina they are piercing the optic nerve. Then so here you can see this nasociliary nerve crossing the optic nerve. Then coming to the oculomotor. So the two divisions of oculomotor enter the orbit through superior orbital fissure within the common tendon string of zinc. Here the nasociliary nerve lies between the two divisions. So in this image I am showing you the two divisions of oculomotor and between them we can identify the nasociliary nerve. <coughs> the smaller superior division runs forwards above the optic nerve and supplies the superior rectus muscle. Yes, then it is piercing the superior rectus muscle and then coming outside and it is piercing the levator palpebris superioris muscle. And then coming to this, yes, here you can identify the two muscles, superior rectus and the levator palpebris superioris. And here I am showing you how the superior branch, smaller division of oculomotor is piercing the two muscles. Yeah. Then coming to the larger inferior division, it passing below the optic nerve and divides into three branches to supply medial rectus then lateral disc supplying it is lateral branch which is supplying to the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique muscle so coming to the trochlear nerve so the trochlear nerve enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure Superolateral to the common tendinous ring of Zinn. Then it curves medially above the levator palpebris superioris to reach deep to the posterior part of superior oblique, which it supplies. 
so the superior oblique is supplied by the trochlear nerve then coming to the abducens nerve so the abducens nerve enters the orbit coming through the intermediate compartment of superior orbital fissure along with the common tendon ring of zin then it is going to divide into different divisions yes and this abducens which is supplying to lateral rectus muscle then coming to the ophthalmic nerve ophthalmic nerve is the first and the smallest of the three divisions of trigeminal nerve it is purely sensory and it is passing through the superior orbital fissure that is giving branches so first one is the branch of, let me show you the branches of the ophthalmic division of trigeminal first one is the smallest branch called as lacrimal branch or the lacrimal nerve so which is running laterally in the orbit i mean at the roof of the orbit which is running laterally and the frontal is the largest branch so the lacrimal nerve which is passing through the lateral compartment of superior orbital fissure and then it is piercing the lacrimal gland and then before it is piercing it is communicating with the zygomatico temporal nerve which is a branch of maxillary division of trigeminal so in this image i'm showing you the communication between the lacrimal branch and the zygomatico temporal nerve then coming to the frontal nerve so frontal nerve is the largest one and the frontal it is going to divide into supra orbital and the supra trochlear supra trochlear which is running medially it is passing through the roof of the orbit we can identify sometimes it is having a different foramen and sometimes it may pass through just crossing the orbital margin base of the orbit and extends upwards then the supra orbital nerve which is passing through the supra orbital notch or the foramen and then it is ascending upwards and supplies to the scalp in front of auricle as yes, here you can identify the supra or trochlear and the supra orbital so protrochlear is medially supra orbital is present laterally then coming to the nasal ciliary nerve nasal ciliary nerve which is passing through the intermediate compartment of superior orbital fissure then this divides into two branches anterior and the posterior ethmoidal nerves yes here you can see this anterior and the posterior ethmoidal nerves they are passing through the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal foramina and enters into the ethmoidal eight sacs yes here you can see the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal nerve and its branches how they enters into the ethmoid bone and enters into the lateral wall of nose then coming to the infratrochlear nerve so the infratrochlear nerve which is the smallest branch which is running down and it is supplying to the external part external nasal part of it that is communicating with this nasal branch of the maxillary division of trigeminal and supplying to the nose part then coming to the ciliary ganglia it is a peripheral parasympathetic ganglia connected with the naso ciliary nerve and although topographically it is connected to the naso ciliary nerve from the ophthalmic division of trigeminal but functionally it is connected to oculomotor nerve what is the location location it is a minute body it is 2 mm in diameter lying near the apex of the orbit between the optic and the lateral rectus muscle so coming to the roots the three roots enter the in, enter its posterior end that is motor that is parasympathetic root preganglionic oculomotor fibers then postganglionic the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers arise from the cells of the ganglia and pass through the short ciliary nerves to supply the ciliary muscle and the sphincter pupillae so here you can identify it is arising from the edinger westphal nucleus yes accessory oculomotor nerve here i am showing you this accessory oculomotor nerve which is coming from edinger westphal nucleus then it is coming through the oculomotor nerve then it is reaching to the ciliary ganglia then it is communicating with the short ciliary nerves 
So the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers coming through the oculomotor nerve, then from the ciliary ganglion, postganglionic parasympathetic fibers arises and they runs along with the short ciliary nerves and supply to the sphincter pupillae. Then coming to the sensory route, it is derived from the nasociliary nerve, it consisting of sensory fibers which are responsible to carry the pain, touch and temperature sensors from the eyeball which pass through the ciliary ganglion without relay. Yes, here you can identify the sensory innervation. It's coming to the sympathetic route. Sympathetic route, let me show you the sympathetic route. So sympathetic route, route coming from the trigeminal nerve, we can identify here. So they are preganglionic sympathetic fibers. They are arising from the T1 segment extending upwards through superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. Then the postganglionic sympathetic fibers coming from this superior cervical sympathetic ganglion and they extends upwards and they runs along with the internal carotid artery and then extends into the orbit through the ciliary ganglion and they supplies to the dilator pupillae and the blood vessels. So the parasympathetic coming from the oculomotor nerve, sympathetic coming from the T1 segment and the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. So this is about sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. And coming the, to the branches, 8 to 10 short ciliary nerves also present. They are, so here you can identify the short ciliary nerves, 8 to 10 short ciliary nerves which are coming from the ciliary ganglion. They supplies to the sphincter pupillae. Then coming to the clinical aspects, the ciliary ganglion is blocked, uh, blocked to produce the dilation of pupil before cataract extraction. Coming to the blood vessels, ophthalmic artery, it arises from the internal carotid artery as it emerges from the roof of cavernous sinus, medial to the anterior clenoidal process close to the optic canal. The artery enters the orbit through optic canal, inferolateral to the optic nerve. So in this image, I'm showing you the location of ophthalmic artery and the origin of ophthalmic artery. Then ophthalmic artery, so here it is crossing the anterior clenoidal process, then enters into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure in the course. So it is enters into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure and it is crossing the optic nerve and it is running from lateral to medial, lateral to medial and it is running above the superior oblique muscle, above the superior oblique muscle and reaching to the anterior part of the orbit then it is giving the branches. So near the medial angle of the eye it terminates by dividing into two branches, one is supratrochlear and the dorsal nasal arteries. Here you can identify the supratrochlear and the dorsal nasal arteries. Then coming to the central artery of retina, central artery reaches the optic disc through the central part of the nerve. It supplies the optic nerve and inner six, six parts of the layer of the retina. It is supplied by central artery of retina. Then coming to the clinical aspects of it, the central artery of retina is an example of typical end artery. Its damage produces sudden total blindness on the side of the lesion. Then coming to the lacrimal artery. Lacrimal artery is a branch of this ophthalmic artery and it is running laterally over the lateral rectus muscle and it is applying to the lacrimal gland. Then branches of the lacrimal artery are the glandular branches to the gla uh, one is glandular branches to the lacrimal gland and two lateral palpebral arteries one on each side of the eyelid then we can identify the two zygomatic branches one is zygomatico facial and zygomatico temporal so the zygomatico facial passing through the zygomatico facial foramen and zygomatico temporal which is passing to the zygomatico temporal foramen which we have seen earlier on the lateral surface of the zygomatic bone Then coming to the recurrent meningeal branch runs backwards to enter the middle cranial fossa through the superior orbital fissure. Then last one is muscular branches which supplies to 
of the recti, oblique, and the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. And posterior ciliary arteries, these are also branches of the ophthalmic, they supply, they are long and short ciliary arteries. Then coming to the other branches are supraorbital artery. Supraorbital artery, which is running along with the supraorbital nerve, passing through the supraorbital foramen or notch and enters into the scalp and supplies to the scalp in front of auricle. Then posterior ethmoidal artery, it is running along the posterior ethmoidal nerve and pierce passing through the posterior ethmoidal foramen and enters into the ethmoid bone. Along with the other branches, anterior ethmoidal artery, it is also running along with the anterior ethmoidal nerve and enters into the ethmoid bone. Then coming to the dorsal nasal artery, it is also called as external nasal artery, which is coming outside and supplies to the root of the nose. And suprotrochlear, so which is the smallest branch, which is running medial to the suprotrochlear artery, it is also supplying to the scalp medial palpebral branches so these medial palpebral branches which are supplying to the upper eyelid so in this image i am showing you the supraorbital artery supraorbital artery and here you can see the posterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal dorsal nasal artery suprotrochlear and the medial palpebral branches that is about arteries. Coming to the veins. Veins are superior ophthalmic vein. Superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior ophthalmic vein. So the superior ophthalmic vein which is draining the venous blood, taking the venous blood and draining into the, it is running posteriorly and drains into the cavernous sinus which is present lateral to the hypophysial fossa. So because the ophthalmic veins drain into the cavernous sinus and communicates with the extracranial veins, they act as the roots through which infection can spread from outside to inside the cranial cavity. Then strabismus or squint, unilateral paralysis of an individual muscle due to involvement of the nerves produces strabismus or squint on the means deviation of the eye to the opposite side and may result in the diplopia means double vision. So here you can see the squint condition. The paralysis of levator palpebrae superioris. Paralysis of levator palpebrae superioris due to involvement of oculomotor nerve leads to complete tosis, means drooping of upper eyelid. So that is about the orbit and its contents. Thank you.